Good evening. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone to the second year of the Dr. Robert Enman Award in Democracy and Political Communication. It's wonderful to be back together in our studio to honor the work and the legacy of Dr. Enman. Thank you for coming to share this very special moment. Unfortunately, Bob uh, cannot join us tonight in person. Uh, also, special thanks to the SMPA staff, Sarah, Maria, Diego, Emma, Tommy, uh, Marie, and Anna for making this event possible. In 2020, uh, SMPA established the award to recognize Dr. Enman, who is Emeritus Professor and was the Shapiro Professor of Media and Public Affairs and Professor of International Affairs. During his distinguished career, Dr. Enman has made key contributions to education and research in political communication with his work on framing, media and race, political scandal, and the dynamics of public opinion. The Enman Award is given annually for excellence in democracy and political communication research. In keeping with Professor Enman longstanding contributions to the field, SMPA selects a researcher whose work is publicly engaged related to topics that are vital to the health of American democracy and of exceptional high quality. Tonight, we are delighted to present the award to Dr. Diana Matz from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Dr. Matz will speak to us for about 20 minutes, and then we'll have what I'm sure is gonna be a very rich conversation about her work, as well as questions at the core of Dr. Enman's work. Uh, next, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Steve Livingstone, who serves as the chair of this year's sel selection committee to introduce Dr. Matz. Steve? Hello, and good evening to everyone. Thank you for coming to this event. I've been so excited about this, so let's, let's get started. I first met Bob Entman in the late 1980s when he and I were on a panel together at an ICA conference in Dublin. It was at the conference, it was a conference in Ireland that uh, I first came to understand the depths of Bob's kindness, his generosity, and his keen sense of humor. I also got to see the colorful ways he sometimes expressed moments of annoyance. One evening uh, at this conference, Bob, Lance Bennett, Ed Herman of Herman and Chomsky fame, if you know that book, uh, and I were crammed in a taxi as it was careening through the wet streets of Dublin, heading to some pub that we were told we had to visit in, while in Dublin. Bob, observing that the driver was being a bit reckless, took matters into hand and told the driver in what might be described as colorful language to, and I, I sort of quote, please slow the F down. <laughs> well, actually, Bob didn't say it quite that way. I, I, I have to admit, I exaggerate a little bit. He, he didn't say please. Um, the driver complied, and to the relief of us all, we arrived at our destination uh, safely, knowing glances of gratitude were shared with Bob by the rest of us. And having made our way to the pub safely, I really don't remember much of the rest of the evening, though I'm sure it was glorious. Bob is, in short, brilliant and deeply passionate about Dublin taxi drivers and politics. But let me tell you a little bit more about my friend of 30 years. As Silvio said, Robert Entman served as the JB and MC Shapiro Professor of Media and Public Affairs and Professor of International Affairs from 2006 to 2019. Among his many honors, Bob received the Humboldt Research Award from the Alexander von Humboldt Stiftung, or the Humboldt Foundation of Germany. He was the first scholar of political communication, indeed one of the few Americans to win this prestigious award. He spent 2012 at the Freie Universität in Berlin, where I had the chance actually to spend some time with him. Bob's other honors include the Murray Edelman Distinguished Career Achievement Award, something that's shared with our, with our guest of honor tonight, and the Doris Graeber Award for the outstanding book in political communication for the landmark book, Projections of Power, Framing News, Public Opinion, Foreign Policy, a University of Chicago Press book. He and Andy Rochecki won the Goldsmith Book Prize from, Har the, from Harvard's Kennedy School, 
for the black image in the white mind, media and race in America, another University of Chicago book. And these are just a few of his many books. And for two decades, he co-edited with Lance Bennett the Cambridge University Press series, book series, Communication, Society, and Politics. As Silvio said, though Bob would love to be with us here tonight, he cannot, but he is here in spirit, and he sends all of you his love and his congratulations. Today we are here to recognize another pathbreaking scholar and to celebrate her achievements by presenting her with the Robert Entman Award in Communication and Democracy. Diana Muntz is the Samuel A. Stauffer Professor of Political Com Science and Communication and Director of the Institute for the Study of Citizens and Politics at the University of Pennsylvania. She is one of the most accomplished and well-respected scholars working in the field today. Let me share some of the reasons why I say that. In 2011, she too received the Murray Edelman Lifetime Distinguished Career Award. In 2008, she was inducted as a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Last year, or was it the year before, she was elected a member of the National Academy of Sciences. In her multiple award-winning books and scores of articles, Professor Muntz has touched on some of the most critical issues in the field of political communication. Her award-winning books include, but are not limited to, Hearing the Other Side, Deliberative versus Participatory Democracy, a Cambridge book from 2006. It won both, both the Robert Lane Prize for Best Book in Political Psychology and the Goldsmith Best Book Award, again from Harvard University. This is only one example of the multiple award-winning books that Professor Muntz has written. In 2014, with Seth Goldman, a Penn PhD and an SMPA political communication graduate, she published The Obama Effect, How the 2008 Campaign Changed White Racial Attitudes. Her most recent book, Winners and Losers, The Psychology of Foreign Trade, a Princeton University Press book published in 2021, looks at public preferences on trade policy. In addition to many award-winning books, Professor Muntz has published numerous articles in journals such as the American Political Science Review, the American Journal of Political Science, Public Opinion Quarterly, Journal of Politics, and Journal of Communication. For all of these reasons and more, Diana Muntz is the perfect recipient for this year's Robert Entman Award in Communication and Democracy. I invite Professor Muntz to join me here on stage and uh, to share a few ideas, but also along the way, this is the opportunity I have, the honor, if you could come up, to present you with our memento of our appreciation. This, I hope, will be displayed proudly on, your, on the wall, and congratulations. <laughs> Go ahead and eat, please. Thank you so much for that very, very generous introduction. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here. I've had a great day visiting with various people I haven't had a time to catch up with in years. Uh, and I really want to start out by just giving you all a, a huge thank you for this recognition, which is marvelous. But on top of that, it's been really fun uh, to talk about research all day today. Thank you also to Maria Jackson, who helped arrange my visit, and Sarah, who's been escorting me around today, and so forth. So again, my sincerest thanks for all of your hospitality. This award is particularly meaningful to me, um, in part because 
Um, as many of you know, I kind of like to dabble in a lot of different areas, and it's one of the things that I think is great about being a scholar is that uh, you can have a really short attention span and get away with it and kind of just keep switching what you're doing. Uh, so I, in this case, though, uh, part of what makes this award really meaningful is I've always suspected that many of the people who tell me they really like my work have never read it. <laughs> and in this case, I know you guys have. This place is, is a real center of political communication scholars, and I'm very, very flattered uh, that you've chosen me for this award as a result, because uh, political communication is where I started, and um, it's still where I am, but uh, as I said, I've kind of dabbled along the way in a lot of different areas. Uh, I also want to reflect a bit on Bob Entman's work. It's very funny that Steve was mentioning the conference, the ICA conference in Dublin. I was there. I was a grad student at the time, uh, first time I'd ever been to Ireland. You were, okay, so, uh, and I had a great time um, in grad school. I knew Bob Entman's work uh, and had read some of it. And, and part of, it's funny, this book has gotten mentioned a lot today, but this is the book I most wanted to highlight because of it framing what I'm still looking at now in another context entirely. And that is, in Projections of Power, Bob looks at who wins these framing contests over foreign policy. And to be frank, there's not as much attention to foreign policy attitudes because of the long standing belief that the public's views on this don't really matter. And I think. 2016 uh, proved otherwise if people weren't convinced already. Uh, but this has been a real uh, launching point for me in looking at foreign policy attitudes and the interaction between media, public opinion, and political elites when it comes to foreign policy. What Bob says in this book, for those of you who haven't read it, is that you know, as of the end of the Cold War, it's not clearly so top down as it used to be anymore. That the interactions among the media, public opinion, and elites are far more complex uh, than we might have thought before that. And uh, my current project that I've really just started on is really an attempt to sort out these same interactions and where things are coming from with respect to foreign policy. In my case, my question is, where did the backlash against globalization, as we call it, come from? What started it? Why is it we all talk about it as if we know this is a, a real thing, and so forth? Did it come from Donald Trump in particular? Or is it really from political elites more generally, public opinion, or the media? And in looking at this, what I decided to start with is really, you know, the conventional wisdom that's out there. And the conventional wisdom largely says it comes from the public. It's the American public that changed its mind about globalization. Uh, it's Trump's victory, which marked the victory of economic nationalism in public opinion. Uh, and the United States, as Jeff Frieden at Harvard says, is by far the most important locus of this backlash against globalization. This is not a controversial view. Um, I could go on and on with examples of it, but certainly in foreign policy circles, there's a lot of hand-wringing these days about is this the end of the liberal world order? Uh, is this the U.S. role in the world fundamentally changing due to what's happened in recent elections. And again, it's in this case, the World Economic Forum founder argues that it's about the anger of people against globalization. Uh, foreign policy expert Robert Kagan has also written extensively about this, claiming that America first has won, and that uh, isolationism, protectionism, and immigration restrictions are now ascendant in public opinion, support for those views. Um, again, uh, yet another quote that globalization has collapsed under the weight of its own hubris. So again, this is something that's not particularly controversial. You hear this view on both the right and the left, uh, that you know, globalization is clearly out of fashion. So I decided to look at the backlash in American public opinion using all the sources I could, although I did limit my sources to 
high quality probability samples of the American public over time that were available in a repeated way. Chicago Council on Global Affairs is a place where I'm uh, part of their survey uh, board, but I use American National Election Study surveys, surveys done through uh, NORC at Chicago and so forth. And I looked at these five issues as indicative of public attitudes toward globalization. So let me just quickly summarize what I found. Isolationism is one of the more interesting attitudes. And just to clarify, I'm talking here not about uh, as opposed to military interventionism. I'm talking about some of the long-term kinds of questions that have been asked, like this one from the American National Election Study that says, this country would be better off if we just stayed home and did not concern ourselves with problems in other parts of the world. So this is a long-term trend from the American National Election Study. And as you can see, uh, it makes the US look like a pretty uh, pro-internationalist country. So the internationalist response to this is to disagree with this statement. And if anything, we have slightly more people now than we had in the past uh, who give the internationalist answer. The biggest difference that you see over time is really in the number of people who say they don't know. Uh, people have opinions on this now uh, in a way that they may not have 20 or 30 years ago. And we see this in other types of questions about globalization related issues as well. So looking at this, you know, at, at worst it's flat, at best it's up a little bit, but um, no strong evidence of what we would call a backlash, an isolationist turn in mass opinion. Whoops, there's the isolationism index. This is the next thing I'm gonna talk about. This is a lot like the ANES question. Uh, the US needs to play an active role in solving conflicts around the world. Uh, it's essential for the US to work with other nations to solve problems such as overpopulation, hunger, pollution. It will be best for the future of the country if we stay out of world affairs. So these five items all intercorrelate very strongly and we use them in an index using NORC data looking over time from before Trump took office to after. And what you see is a lot of nothing, really. <laughs> what you see is a very flat line. You can see it go down a little bit, but basically um, there has not been a lot of change. Despite Trump's election, despite COVID, uh, and even after Biden's election, it hasn't really gone up much. It's just basically stayed flat. Uh, so again, kind of surprising to me when I first started looking at this because I thought, oh, we've supposedly become a more isolationist country. There is a sense in which we have become uh, more polarized on attitudes toward isolationism. If you look pre-Trump uh, to here at the end of our series, which is 2021, um, you'll see that Republicans and Democrats are further apart with Republicans being more isolationist than Democrats. But um, there's no solid evidence of decline in uh, internationalism or an increase in isolationism in the US. What's interesting that I studied uh, a bit with uh, one of my undergrad classes uh, last spring is that there's been a generational kind of flip in who isolationists are. So this is the NES question all the years it's been asked, but we looked at uh, 30 or younger, which is what my class wanted to look at because they all are in that bracket, and those 60 and older. And it's indicative of a flip in the relationship between age and isolationism. Blah. It used to be that old people were the isolationists. That is, those 60 and over were the ones who wanted to focus on the US and not spend our resources on international kinds of involvement. Um, and that was true up until around 2000, and then it flips, and what we see is that those 30 and younger are far more isolationist than older people are. I found this kind of surprising, and uh, we did a big content analysis of social media as part of this class as well, and one of the things that was fascinating about it is 
Uh, well, I'll, those of you who are younger and on social media a lot will recognize this one term that comes up all the time on social media, colonialism. Uh, colonialism and colonizer and all these kinds of things, these are negative things that get said about US government. And the term colonizer is, is used a bit differently from the traditional land grab kind of thing. It's used to mean that US foreign policy is self-interested and arrogant. And interestingly, I found that, you know, even among my own students, their attitudes toward, you know, foreign aid, for example, which I had thought because my students are overwhelmingly uh, Democrats, that they would be pro-foreign aid. They're not. Um, they see that as condescending to other countries and as harmful to them in many cases. So really interesting shift in opinion when it comes to isolation based on age, because it's exactly the opposite of what I might have anticipated. What about immigration? This is obviously uh, a very high profile issue. It still is, even though Trump is no longer president, but it certainly came to prominence during his presidency. Here's a, a longer term trend from the ANES uh, that shows it by party. And as you can see, there is an increase in uh, wanting to tighten border security and spend more on it among Republicans, but the downturn in support for that uh, among independents and Democrats more than offsets it. So if we looked at this as an aggregate trend, uh, it's less supported than it used to be. But that's just one way to talk about immigration, obviously, is border security. The percent of people who are against building the wall on the border, if we look at that, again, relatively flat until very recently. Uh, and Republicans don't change nearly as much as Democrats and independents do in being against the wall. So again, it's another trend where in the aggregate, we are just don't see a big backlash at all or increased support for the wall. In fact, we see a greater percentage of people being against the wall uh, than were in the past. Obviously, there's a big gap here uh, in terms of when this was asked. So we also have an a immigration index that asks a whole bunch of questions about immigration that correlate strongly with one another. And in that case, we again see a lot of nothing. That is, we see stability in public opinion on immigration. We don't see a massive kind of swing that you might expect if you read the papers and hear that there's been a groundswell of opposition to immigration. Uh, this to me was quite surprising in light of my sense of public opinion from reading the news. Uh, again, this is from the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Is immigration a critical threat or not? And again, what you see is some increase among Republicans that is more than offset by declines among independents and Democrats. So polarization in these views, absolutely we see polarization. But a backlash against globalization, it would be hard to characterize the American mass public as a whole that way. Um, based on these trends. What about international organizations? Trump obviously targeted uh, many different international organizations, arguing that we shouldn't be giving them money, we shouldn't be participating in them, and so on and so forth. So we also looked at attitudes toward groups like NATO, the World Health Organization, the WTO, United Nations, etc. And again, polarization here at the end, but pretty darn flat. Not a lot of change in support uh, and trust in NATO is how the question is asked in this case. We get very much the same thing for the United Nations, very flat, except for the fact that Democrats increase their trust at the same time that Republicans decrease it and offset it. Trust in the World Health Organization, a lot of polarization there, again, particularly around the time of COVID, um, but not a net decline uh, that we can document. And then the World Trade Organization, um, again, with all of the anti-trade rhetoric, you might think that people had come to dislike 
Uh, the World Trade Organization, that's true among Republicans. There's definitely been a decline. But overall, it's really about polarization more than a backlash against globalization uh, as a whole. International trade is obviously a big part of the backlash that people talk about. Uh, so I also looked at trade attitudes in both the short term and long term. The very first explanation that you know comes out when you think about globalization and trade is job loss. And certainly economists have made the argument that it's the China shock that happened from uh, basically the late 1990s through 2007 that is responsible um, for public opinion turning against trade and for people voting for Trump, essentially. That it's um, those who were hurt by globalization in this very direct way uh, that turned against it. It's possible, and the problem I have with the, the studies that try to connect this to voting, first of all, there's this massive decline up through 2010. And then at that point, manufacturing jobs start to recover, right, during the Obama and Trump administrations. Why in 2016, when things are improving, is that the time that voters who've been hurt by globalization decide to take it out on uh, the Democratic Party in particular. So it's, a, you know, it's an argument that economists make frequently, but the timing is odd for someone who's an election scholar because we know people's memories are not very long when it comes to voting. Uh, and economic downturns, when they precede voting by even more than a couple years, tend not to have much of an influence. So again, this is probably the most prominent explanation, but the China shock ended in 2007. So why didn't it influence the 2008 election or the 2012 election and so forth? Why did it wait? That's my question about linking it directly to economic misfortune. Also, the studies that look at economic misfortune in people's lives don't show that they're the ones who supported Trump ultimately. Uh, they were high income uh, overall and improving in their economic well-being at the time. Support for trade is in many ways shocking because Donald Trump did more to increase support for international trade than any politician. And I say that because most politicians won't touch trade with a 10-foot pole. Trump argued you know, that we're being ripped off and it was horrible. However, as you can see, as soon as he was elected, support for, tr support for trade increased, surprisingly. And it increased primarily among Trump voters. And this is something that um, I call the party in power effect. We see it, I don't see it for a lot of issues, but for trade attitudes, we definitely see it. So this is it broken down by party. And what you'll see is Trump supporters, Republicans, immediately increase once Trump is elected. Democrats, on the other hand, don't. And then what we see is when Biden is elected, Democrat, I'm sorry, Republicans go down in their support for trade and Democrats go up. So the movement we're seeing has a lot more with the party holding the presidency than it does in people's thinking about trade uh, per se. And in fact, I find this exact same relationship also in 2008 and 2012. Uh, there are too many lines overlapping here. But basically, if you look at the dark black lines, Republicans before and after the 2008 election, and Democrats before and after the 2008 election, what you'll see is when Obama won, Democrats became more supportive of trade. Uh, then in 2012, uh, what we see is nothing happened because the party in power didn't change and everything is just flat as you might expect under those circumstances from pre-election to post-election. And again, these surveys are so close together, nothing happened in between uh, except that they became the party in power. So what about China? Certainly China is a, a source of grave concern these days and Trump spent a lot of time talking about the threat from China. Uh, he, you know, emphasized that threat, but at the same time, what we see, uh, this is a question asking people whether China is an economic opportunity or an economic threat. 
to the United States. And what you see, again, is surprisingly flat until COVID hits. And what you see is there's some decline there as soon as COVID hits uh, that remains lower after that. And here's what's really interesting. When you break it down by party, uh, the COVID decline is moderated clearly by partisanship. You don't see it at all among Democrats. You see it very clearly among Republicans and then to a lesser extent among independents. So the idea of China bashing, actually during Trump's presidency, people's attitudes toward China didn't seem to get any more negative at all. Uh, in fact, they're slightly higher once Trump was elected, but meaning they see it, China as more of an opportunity. But when COVID hit and using China as a scapegoat for, for COVID, that appeared to work quite well uh, in encouraging negative attitudes toward our economic involvement with China. I've obviously gone through a lot of issues in a hurry. Let me just briefly mention a few other things that are assumed to be part of this backlash against globalization, particularly rising nationalism, ethnocentrism, and declining trust in government. All of those things are often mentioned in, as part of this package. Um, in terms of nationalism, again, nothing has changed since Trump was elected, since pre-Trump. Uh, to post-Biden, levels of nationalism in the U.S. look just the same. Trust in government is another one of these issues which not surprisingly just flips based on which party's in power, but there is no you know, aggregate decline. It's just about partisanship uh, more than anything else. So basically, oh, and ethnocentrism, it's the same. Again, it's perfectly flat when we look at negative attitudes toward outgroups. And this is a piece my colleague Dan Hopkins has published in Public Opinion Quarterly. Basically, I have decided at least if we're going to talk about a backlash against uh, globalization in the mass public, that part is kind of a myth. Um, that is, issue positions tied to being pro-globalization have either stayed the same, become more favorable, or they've polarized along party lines. Um, I don't find any evidence of net decline across these various issues. There is evidence, obviously, that it, globalization is partisan and that Democrats are more supportive than our Republicans. That's true. But there's no, none of the evidence of what people think of as the rise of populism and so forth, declining trust, uh, ethnocentrism, and nationalism, we don't see the kind of swings that I would think we would when we're talking about the way that we talk about these kinds of trends over time. Yet the backlash is widely believed by the public, by policymakers, and so forth, and usually they attribute it to mass opinion. So back to kind of Bob's original question, where did this idea come from? Um, did it come from real world impact on people? Did it come from elite policy actions and so forth? What I have found thus far, and again, I really welcome input on where else to look, but of course the first place I look as a political communication scholar is I look at the media coverage of a backlash against globalization, opposition to globalization. This is about, I think, 50 different newspapers. Uh, and what you see is really not much until Trump is elected. And so the backlash against globalization, really the notion of a backlash took root as an explanation for the 2016 campaign outcome. Uh, and it has persisted obviously since then. The interesting part is that I think people's perceptions are often at odds with reality. And what I mean by this is this is actually a, 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 a pre-midterm uh, survey that is just coming out of the field that I looked at today. We asked people, do they believe that globalization is a good or a bad thing for the United States? 54% of Americans say it's a good thing. Only 21% say it's bad, and the rest are in the middle and say it's neither. Doesn't affect the country one way or another. 
So we have an overwhelming sense that people think it's a good thing. Uh, yet, when we ask people, have Americans become more supportive of globalization, more opposed to it, or haven't they changed their views either way, more people say, oh, they've become opposed to it. So there's definitely a perception out there that the American public is anti-globalization. That perception doesn't appear to be uh, uh, consistent with what we actually see when we ask people. We've also, in a number of different years, asked people about trade and their perceptions of mass support. And again, despite higher levels of trade support than we've had any time in our nation's history right now, because Republicans are on board as well as Democrats, which is not usually how it works, um, we find that mo a, a majority will say Americans have become more opposed to international trade. The red bars are Americans have become more opposed to it. Uh, the green is Americans have become more supportive of it. So public opinion and public's perception of opinion are clearly not the same thing. Now what I don't have at the moment is an elite sample, uh, a sample of policymakers and so forth. But I suspect that they will look like the better educated, politically interested and involved folks in regular surveys as well, in that uh, the more media you consume, the more likely you are to say Americans have turned against trade and Americans are anti-globalization. So it seems to be that uh, those of us who do tune in get an impression from media that is at odds with reality, uh, except for perhaps among the Republican Party in particular. This is consistent with a number of studies that have uh, sampled elites and found that generally their perceptions of mass opinion are far more conservative than mass opinion actually is. And that's a finding that's come from several different sources at this point. So basically, you know, there, there's definitely been policy action that represents a backlash against public opinion, no doubt about that not just in the Trump administration, but elsewhere as well. Even Biden, when he came into office, his first, one of his first acts anyway, was his Buy American plan. So there's a perception out there among policymakers that you can't touch this stuff with a 10-foot pole, that it will harm you in terms of your popularity to be associated with globalization. And yet, um, I think that's probably not the case. What bothers me uh, most about this in terms of the media coverage and interpretation of the election is that I think they largely missed the real story. And what I mean by that is um, it was very easy from exit poll results to say, oh, look, it's these less educated white areas that became pro-Trump. And that's where his support came from. And that's absolutely true. It was less educated white areas that swung toward Trump. But they interpreted education to mean income. And the press cast an economic interpretation on those data that meant the less educated were also lower income. Those who supported Trump were not. And in fact, I think the real story here is the diploma divide, meaning that there's been a, a really surprising change. In terms of income levels, Republicans have always had higher incomes on average than Democrats, and that is still the case now. But in terms of Democrats, Democrats used to be the less educated party, Republicans the better educated, and income and education just went together like one might expect. But now that's not the case. Democrats are better educated but lower income. Um, than our Republicans. So this flip has happened very recently and has not received near the attention of the idea of the left behind voter economically. And yet I think it's a, it's a marvelous case for the value of higher education in particular because what we see as driving a lot of this is racial attitudes and splits over support for multiculturalism in the US. And that's something that is heavily correlated with education, but not income. So in any case, I am going to be exploring 
more about where the backlash came from and the perceptual phenomenon as real as well as the real one uh, in the months to come. And I welcome your comments and suggestions. Thank you. <laughs> Take your time. So the floor is open. I can look at the mic. Um, Bill? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you again. Um, and also for the lunch, lunch talk, and congrats mm -hmm. for the award. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know if the microphone's working or not, but I'll just keep holding it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I've been, I've, been, I've been thinking since your lunchtime talk, and I, I think I, I look at this through the lens of uh, someone from Detroit. Mm -hmm. uh, where free trade, r you know, resonates in a different kind of way. So I'm kind of wondering, um, have you thought much about regionality? Um, and I, maybe, maybe part of the part of the overblown emphasis on trade is that certain swing states or certain key areas that politically matter in the national landscape are maybe that maybe it resonates <laughs> differently there. So I'm just curious if you've disaggregated by by region. Yeah, not only by region, but also by how many jobs were lost due to trade in the area. And part of, again, what's difficult, the reason I showed that time span of the loss of manufacturing jobs is that overwhelmingly these jobs were lost. And, you know, it was a big economic shock, much more than economists had predicted would happen. Um, Northern Indiana experienced the same thing, the automobile and steel industry there. Nonetheless, because it was long enough ago didn't seem to play a role at all in recent voting. Now, we could go back and look at the earlier elections when it was actually happening, um, but we don't see evidence of, you know, being in a town or a commuting zone uh, where a lot of jobs have been lost in the last five to ten years having any impact. The people who have found a relationship are tying it to job loss in the place where you live now, in the election that you voted in now, but what happened back then. And so it's a tough thing because we, c you know how it is. You can change your time frame and get a different <laughs> result. The question is, is that a reasonable time frame for electoral behavior to react? And that's the real question. You can l find a link if you go back that far. Hi, uh, over here. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse Holland, SMPA. Did you see any correlation between news consumption and attitudes of, about globalization? For example, did the rise of social media change any of the in any of the data that you saw about the attitudes toward globalization? Um, what I have seen thus far, there's not a lot about trade on social media. There's a lot on foreign policy in general, uh, but not trade in particular. Uh, where trade coverage was very little, few and far between, before Trump, it was almost all anti, in the sense that, you know, it didn't matter if it was a liberal publication or a conservative publication, they celebrated the idea of uh, making things here, they were very complimentary toward those who tried to buy American, and so forth. So, in general, the press was pretty... I don't know what I'd call boosterish in a way, uh, that this was a way to be a loyal American. And in fact, I remember having a conversation before I published my book with one of my neighbors where they said, no, isn't that like, you know, cheering for the home team? We've got to, you know, be American and buy American. And that argument that it's a matter of loyalty to one's country um, was clearly a persuasive one. But no, on social media, there's a lot about arrogance in American foreign policy. And it really isn't about trade in particular. It's just about foreign policy. Um, unrelated to trade in particular, but over the years, I, I have planned someday, when I have time, to do the study of what is war exactly. And I say this because <laughs> when my dad was in his early 80s, he had he was a tennis player in college and really wanted to go to a grand slam. He wanted to go to the French Open. So the kids got together, sent him to France. I was the only kid who spoke French, so I got to go with him. <laughs> um, I'm not a tennis player at all. But in any case, we went to the French Open, which happens to occur right 
uh, at the time of the D-Day celebrations on the beaches of Normandy. So I took my dad there. He'd never been to Paris or anything like that. And we were walking through the graveyard, and he said, boy, they don't make wars like they used to. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, you know, we all knew we were at war then. It was not as if there was a question. And at that point, I started adding to my surveys this question about whether the U.S. is currently in war. And I don't know what you'd guess. Um, I gave a free bottle of wine to my colleague who came closest to the percentage. But the first time I asked it, it was about 50%. Thought we were, 50% thought we weren't. That number, it's gone up and down since I started doing, asking this question regularly. But it's fascinating because we don't really agree on what a war is. We know there are these conflicts going on in the background, but I suspect that uh, knowledge of the war in Afghanistan only went up after we ended the war in <laughs> Afghanistan, and they started calling it the war in Afghanistan more often. Uh, so in general, I think it is hard to tell. We don't declare war. Congress isn't doing something that makes us all clearly aware. And it's obviously highly problematic because the public completely loses touch with what's going on. There are things that make you more aware of it, like, but it's not overwhelmingly. Like military families, they're more likely to say we're at war because they know what's going on and where. But yeah, foreign policy-wise, it's n even less attention than people pay domestically. But I do think trade is the way that people kind of thought of trade as a domestic problem. Uh, rather than as an international problem, even though in other circles it's always been thought of as part of foreign policy. Mm -hmm. but yeah, it, okay. it, if there's time, I had sure. a question. Is this on? Yeah? Okay. Um, yeah, I wanted to know, um, since I don't do this kind of research, and it's very interesting, thank you for presenting it, um, when, you, when the survey is in the field, how do you know how people are interpreting the word globalization? Because there's so many ways to think about it. Absolutely true. Actually, I didn't ask, I've only twice ever asked about globalization for that very reason. I thought it could be anything. I don't know what people think this means. And particularly because there are other words like globalism, which some people use to talk about this conspiracy theory stuff and everything. So. I actually only asked about issues that I thought were clearly tied to globalization for most of this. Recently, I started asking about globalization as well, just because now the term is being used in the sense there's a backlash against globalization. Well, what do they mean by that? Do they mean immigration? Do they mean trade? Do they mean protectionism? Whatever. I don't know. Yeah. So, so <coughs> my question has kind of back to the definition around globalization and how you're able to make sure or understand how it might get um, wrapped into this idea of conflict and war because of mm -hmm. how how that negative connotation mm -hmm. with sending our sort of so many families to war. So uh, most of these issue attitudes don't have anything to do with attitudes toward military intervention in particular. Um, and again, just to put boundaries on what I was studying, I'm not asking people about interventions where there's direct US military involvement. However, we do ask people about Ukraine. Um, because obviously, the US, many of the fears that people who are against uh, supporting Ukraine have is that we will be drawn into war as a result of that. Uh, so, you know, that we asked about. We've also asked, since it became an issue, about Taiwan, um, things where people have talked about prospects of war. But again, thus far, what we see is that these kinds of attitudes are much more driven, honestly, by racial attitudes and ethnocentrism. It's the idea that we should just take care of our own and forget about the rest of the world and their leeches who are taking away from our resources, essentially. Not a lot of um, awareness of our interdependence. Um, that ship has kind of sailed, and it's out there. And I think one of the interesting things about media coverage that I talk about in a, a book I published last year is that media coverage got much better um, of things like trade during uh, Trump's administration. And I say that meaning they covered 
not only the poor guy, usually a white male, who lost his job in manufacturing, they also covered people who were hurt by lack of trade. Uh, and there are those people. There were a lot of them. There were stories about suicides due to economic decline. Among farmers, in particular, the suicide rate was very high. Um, there are other people other than white men in manufacturing. <laughs> and I think that um, coverage of job loss, it's influenced a lot by you know press releases that go out from unions and things like that, which is fine. They should be doing that. But I think the whole trope of the left-behind manufacturing worker kind of got out of hand <laughs> as a journalistic trope after two 2016, even during the election. I want to go back to Pat Phelan's really interesting question, and you know better, far better than I do, but how one tries to get at a sentiment, an idea, and the words that you use really produce different outcomes. I'm mm -hmm. struck by, is it correct to say, a fairly technical sort of approach in referring to trade rather than globalization or neoliberalism, a lot of the academic? Nobody's heard of neoliberalism. <laughs> well, <laughs> in the mass uh, public, some people, yeah. 90 percent. But yeah. most people, you know, there's a huge number of people who can't right. say if they're liberal or conservative, let alone talk about neoliberalism. But that's an interesting thing, because amongst elite policymakers, amongst academics, amongst people who yeah, write books, different it, it's a very different vocabulary. It is. And it's a vocabulary, interestingly enough, the, the, in my own research, I'm finding that it's the, n the newer nationalist Republicans who are, are, in some sense, most opposed to neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost as if they've changed places with the old left Democrats. Well, what I would do if I wanted to get at attitudes toward neoliberalism, I wouldn't use that term. I would try to take the essence of neoliberalism and ask them about that. And um, that's a lot of the, the surveys that my institute does um, with the NORC. We never have just one question on an issue. It's always an index so that we can ask the same kind of question multiple different ways. In most cases, we find that they're so strongly intercorrelated, it really doesn't make a difference, so we use them as a combined index. But we know question wording can influence things, so we always want to do things multiple different ways. Um, we, you know, there are people out there who say you can't ask people about international trade. They think that's too difficult to ask the mass public. I don't believe that anymore in the sense that, I, yes, they don't have economic sophistication and a deep understanding of international <laughs> commerce, but they do understand the idea of goods moving around. And nothing has brought it home more than supply chain problems. All of a sudden, people are acutely aware. Uh, we had our refrigerator die. and. It took us over a year to get a new <laughs> refrigerator. <laughs> so we had to deal with a little one for a while. But yeah, I mean, the supply chain has had real effects on people's lives. And I think, it's, I mean, obviously, I don't want supply chain problems. But it's good in the sense that it is increasing awareness of our interconnectedness with other countries. Just as the fact that, oh, we can't slap tariffs on things and not get a reaction from China or other countries back that hurts uh, our exports. That's a valuable kind of thing that I think peop more people know about now than they did pre-Trump. Hi. Um, I had a question in terms of what you've noticed in terms of public opinion towards foreign policy, specifically in comparison of our adversaries versus allies, traditional al adversaries versus allies, um, and if there's been anything particularly illuminating over social media, um, I think that the comparison between Russia and Israel, for example, has been really interesting in the last couple of years with recent events. So I was wondering if you had anything on that. Yeah, I mean, my analyses of social media, we went back about mm, seven years looking at things. First of all, uh, not surprisingly, most of social media is not about politics at all. But of the part that is, um, there is a lot of discussion, not just among people within the US, but on social media, it can be people in other countries too. 
And that's an interesting part of it. Do people follow people who are not fellow Americans on this? Um, a lot of, as I said, what we found is that America is seen both domestically by people on social media as well as by those in other countries as arrogant in foreign policy, self-interested in its foreign policy attitudes, uh, and I mean, it was really interesting because uh, my undergrad class, I ended up showing uh, a movie at one point, which is a documentary made um, by someone from Norway, but the idea that any foreign aid ever did any good anywhere was just not <laughs> accepted by my undergrads. It was really interesting, and I just wanted to give them um, some view of the other side. And so this particular documentary interviews you know, people who have gone to work for American companies overseas. Um, and they acknowledge sweatshops, they acknowledge all that kind of stuff in this thing. But it's really interesting to me that there is such a difference because I think my association was, oh, these liberal Democrats will be pro uh, foreign aid and pro helping Ukraine and so forth. They're actually much less supportive than our older people. Um, on these things, and the older people tend to be more conservative. So that to me was surprising. Yeah, but overall, I mean, we weren't looking for Russia in particular, so I can't speak to that uh, more generally, but I can speak to anything that was globalization related, we kind of honed in on and analyzed. Other questions? Ah, I'll catch it. Go ahead, one more. <laughs> sure, if there is one more, yeah. One more, because we have a taxi waiting back there. All right, Steve. I think in the way you were describing the Chicago Democratic Party, that was completely uneducated to understand what you're talking about politics. Probably, that must be it. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in this question about, um, you talk about trade and you mentioned farmers and there are whole segments of the American economy that depend extremely heavily on trade, mm -hmm. starting with agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet they also are, are considered quite conservative in terms of where the, the regions and, and other attitudes. I'm interested in the tension there because clearly you go to a hog farming area of North Carolina, they're exporting 90% of their hogs, Absolutely. right? So therefore, w how do they resolve this tension between their economic self-interest and their sort of cultural conservatism? Thus far, they have resolved it in favor of their conservatism, <laughs> meaning that those folks did support Trump. And if uh, I highly recommend my book, Winners and Losers, that came out in 2021, which is about exactly this. And I have a lot of people in their own words talking about why they stand where they stand on trade. And many of them just up front say, yeah, I know it's hurting me. I know it's hurting my business. Uh, but we got to stand. It's like, it's like we're at war. That's what they, the way they would put it. It's like we're at war with China, and we need to stand by you know, our president and you know, be pro-US. So they s see it as a matter of national loyalty uh, to you know, stand up against other countries. Right, oh, absolutely, absolutely. But they look at it through, you know, Trump talks about it in terms of import penetration, basically. You know, oh, job loss, I'm gonna save all these people who've lost jobs by putting tariffs on things. Of course, you put tariffs on things and the other country does the same and then you have no export market. That's the kind of thing that I think has been a learning curve. Um, whether or not it'll continue to be people like farmers not uh, really supporting their self-interest economically, I don't know. But the ones that we interviewed, who uh, both the random sample and uh, select people that we went into greater depth with, they really saw it as symbolically important to stand up to others, to be, you know, Trump turned trade into a, a dominance game, and we're gonna dominate these other countries by coming up with these trade deals that benefit us and hurt them. 
of course, they're never going to sign on to trade deals <laughs> like that because that hurt their country. So, you know, but that's what he promised. <laughs> I need to train a lot, but I have a problem with the line. No, I know. I can I run for it. I'm easy. I'm easy on the train. I'm used to catching it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Stay here, you know, don't go anywhere. Right. Maybe I'll be crazy to have some. Okay. <laughs>